All right, so I guess we're recording now. So I'm back with another video, and this has been uh, in the works for the last few weeks or so. Uh, anyways, recently there's been some debate between uh, Ed Finiger and Kevin Zacker, and it's over the eternal sonship of Christ. And and this uh, teaching, this or this doctrine, I agree with Kevin Zacker, who uh, affirms the eternal sonship of Christ, and Ed Finninger believes in what's called the incarnational sonship. Anyways, I've kind of went over these things in past videos, and um, I've been wanting to do a video on the eternal sonship of Christ and the generation, the eternal generation of Christ for a long time anyways, ever since I have did the videos on the pre-existence of Christ and the deity of Christ and the person and natures of Christ. You know, distinguishing between you know person and nature, and uh, so I mentioned these things, and, and I'm glad that I'm finally getting to it. But it's just taken me a while. I uh, you know it's lots of different things going on, and just going through these studies. Um, so I've kind of split it into four parts, and today I want to cover the divine sonship of Christ and the significance of the terms father and son. So this is kind of like an introduction to the thing in a way. Just going over the terms father and son, and um, you know the the the, son, the divine sonship of Christ, and then I want to go over the eternal sonship of Christ, uh, the fact that the second person of the Trinity always existed as the Son, and uh, before the incarnation, and you know eternally, and then the eternal generation of Christ or the Son, which means. Um, talking about how the Son was begotten of the Father and what that what that means. And then I also want to have another part that's going to be on the eternal submission of the Son to the Father, um, because there seems to be some issue with Ed Finiger, and I don't know how other people who believe in the incarnational sonship, I don't know if they agree with him or not, but he has a problem with uh, this idea that the Son eternally submits to the Father. And so, anyways, yeah, uh, for all these studies I used uh, some really good articles that I found that I don't agree with everything on them. I don't always, uh, you know, cite all my sources and stuff, but I will say that I used Jesus is the Eternal Son of God by David Abernathy, and these are PDFs that you can find on Google. You can do a search. So Jesus is the Eternal Son of God by David Abernathy. Uh, use that a little bit, and the Eternal Submission of the Son to the Father by Wayne Grudem, and the Eternal Sonship of Christ by George Zeller and Reynolds Showers. And I use a lot more of those too. And um, so anyway, I guess I'll just try to get into this. So the terms Father and Son entail each other. The Father is called Father only because Jesus is his Son. And Jesus is called Son only because he is the Son of his divine Father. Each is essential to the identity of the other. So to say that Jesus and the Father are one is to say that the unique divine identity comprises the relationship in which the Father is who he is only in relation to the Son, and vice versa. Okay, so... Um, you know, the Father can't be the Father without the Son. The Son can't be the Son without the Father, okay? Um, so to say that, you know, the, the Father existed eternally, but yet the Son... You know, to say that the first person of the Trinity existed as the Father eternally, but the second person of the Trinity didn't exist as the Son eternally, then that doesn't make any sense, okay? Uh, the Son would have to be just as eternal as the Father is. Otherwise, the Father's not the Father, or the Son's not the Son. So I wanted, uh, added some uh, definitions of father and son from the Webster's 1828 dictionary. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a thing on the side, really. I guess it kind of doesn't really have a whole lot to do with this. But, you know, the main um, definition of father is he who begets a child. But then there's other senses, a lot of other senses in which fathers are used. You know, um, the first ancestor or progenitor of a race or family, like Adam is the father of the human race, uh, Abraham is the father of the Israelites, um, 
sometimes just elders are called fathers. <clears throat> the same with son, there's lots of different usages. A male child, male issue of a parent, father or mother. Um, the compilation of an old man to a young one. Uh, let's see, native or inhabitant of a country as the sons of Britain. One adopted, an adopted son. You know, the same with father. There's father in law, grandfather. Uh, but, anyways, we are the first person of the Trinity is referred to as the Father, and the second person of the Trinity is referred to as the Son. So, in what sense is Jesus the Son of God? So um, this is really interesting to me, and it kind of gets into philosophy a little bit. I'm going to use scripture in this, of course, but um, you know, in the upcoming studies on the other issues, the eternal sonship and uh, eternal submission and stuff, there's a lot more scripture. But anyways, in what sense is Jesus the Son of God? The sonship of Christ is a metaphysical and essential sonship that is eternal and real. It is the essence of who he is eternally. So this is the person of Christ. He is the Son. It is who he is. You see, and God doesn't change, and that's kind of the issue here. When they when people say that Jesus wasn't the Son until the incarnation. So you know, I found this really interesting. And uh so I guess that I'll just write these words on here. Metaphysical. Essential okay. eternal and real. That is the sonship of Christ. Okay. And so basically it's not a metaphor, okay, it's speaking of the Son of Christ. Um it's very real that he is the son. Uh, you know, it's beyond, uh, you know, our physical. It's metaphysical. It's essential to who he is. And he is the son eternally. So, the father-son relation is an eternal pattern, inherent in the very nature of the persons of the Trinity, and is one that he has built into our own human experience in order to teach us something about himself. And I found this interesting, this couple of verses, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And so Paul is saying not only that the whole Christian family is named from the Father, but that the very no notion of fatherhood is derived from the fatherhood of God. In this case, the true relation between human fatherhood and the divine fatherhood is neither one of analogy. God is a father like human fathers. For example, okay, it's not saying that it's not saying that God is a father like human fathers, nor one of projection, uh, such as Freud's theory that we have invented God because we needed a heavenly father figure, but rather one of Derivation. <laughs> yeah, derivation. Okay, it derives, our, our fatherhood derives from God the Father. God's fatherhood being the archetypal, the archetypal reality, the source of all conceivable fatherhood. Okay, fatherhood on earth is but a dim reflection or shadow of God's eternal fatherhood. The divine fatherhood and sonship are not conceptual constructs that have their origin in human relations and experiences. Human experience of fatherhood and sonship, that is, the parent-child relation, derives from the eternal pattern of relations in the Trinity. The term sonship, used with reference to Jesus, expresses a unity of nature, unique intimacy, and close fellowship between him and the Father. So I found that really interesting, and I think that, you know, I possibly could have had a wrong view on that before. And um, so, you know, I never really thought about it that deeply, that, uh, you know, 
fatherhood, sonship, you know, or even, you know, daughter or mother, you know, this comes from God. Okay, the example of Jesus as the father, or I mean, not Jesus as the father, I'm sorry. Now, I don't want to start saying that, that's what Denlinger teaches. No, I'm saying the relationship between the father and the son, okay, um, Jesus is not the father, Jesus is the son. Anyway, oh. But the, their uh, pattern for, you know, their relationship is, it's the archetype for us. And, you know, our fatherhood, father-son relationship derives from theirs. So, anyway. So basically, here's getting more down into the meat of this, okay? What sonship signifies, Okay. And I have four different categories here we're going to go over, and that is, okay, the first one is going to be distinction, okay. All right, let's see here, what do we want to do? Okay. Sonship signifies... Distinction. Okay. The son is a distinct person from the father. I got some passages here. John chapter 5, verse 19 through 22. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The son can do nothing of himself. See, the son is one person. Well, what he seeth the father do. Father is another person. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will, sh will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them. So we see, he says, the Father showeth the Son all things. Okay, it doesn't say that the Son showeth the Father all things. You see, there's these distinctions between these two persons. There is a priority where the Father is number one in the Trinity. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. You see, the Son didn't committeth all judgment to the Father. The Father committeth all judgment to the Son. You see, so the Father has some authority, has a, a priority, a number one priority to the Son. There's a distinction of persons. That's something that son, sonship signifies. John chapter 6, verse 38 and 39, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The Son came from heaven, not the Father. The Father sent the Son, not the Son sent the Father. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Okay? So we see some clear distinctions there. The Trinity, God is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each with distinct personal attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. The Mediator, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is the divinely appointed Mediator between God and man. So, I'm going to write those passages down for this, where we see some clear distinctions very easily. John chapter 5, verse 19 through 22, and John chapter 6, verse 38 and 39. So the next one is going to be nature. Sonship signifies nature. 
Okay. The Son has the same nature as the Father. And John, sonship, expresses the unity of nature, close fellowship, and unique intimacy between Jesus and the Father. Human fatherhood and sonship are only a faint copy of, relation, of the relation between God the Father and God the Son. As Son of God, sharing the nature of the Father, He is able to reveal God. Um, and, you know, uh, I just want to note, too, that, you know, when I've learned more from this, and I guess, I mean, it's kind of common sense, but, you know, Jesus is the unique Son of God, which means, you know, as believers, we're adopted sons of God, but Jesus is unique in that He is the only begotten Son of God, okay? Jesus is a divine person, okay? We are not. And so when Jesus is spoken of as the Son of God, it's not in the same sense as us that he's adopted. It's that he is, you know, in a sense, a direct descendant in a way. Okay, he is the only and first begotten of the Father. Um, and so forgive me if I'm not getting everything clear here with all my terms and stuff. And fumbling up, you know, whenever I do this, I'm very nervous and stuff. And, you know, a lot of... You know, and I'm still, I feel like I'm rushing this study even though I spent a lot of time on it. And, uh, you know, that's just the way things are. And, you know, as, as we learn, we grow. And, you know, as we grow, we learn. And, uh, you know, it's all a work in process. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is just me trying to get this out here and to, you know, further on the study of Christ, on the doctrine of Christ. And, you know, as the more as, you know, I get closer to, you know, kind of completing that, you know, I can go over things more and more and refine them better. So anyways, uh, <clears throat> and that's why it's good, you know, to have things on the website, I think. And, you know, I can post the uh, link to uh, my page on here where I basically simplified, you know, all these articles that I was looking at and stuff because, you know, it's easier to type things out and not make error and to review those things than it is to, you know, I'm freestyling and just recording as I go along. Anyways, so sonship signifies nature. Because Jesus is the Son of God, he shares the same nature as God. And this is what the Jews understood when Jesus said that he was the Son of God. In John chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, when Jesus answered them, My Father, he said, My Father, speaking of God, therefore he's proclaiming to be the Son. If he says, My Father, that means that he is the Son. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but, also, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Okay, and they said that was blasphemy. Okay, he's saying that he is God, that he is divine. Okay, that he is from God, that God is his father. So his sonship signifies his divine nature. John chapter 10 verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God, Okay, the way that I read that was kind of weird. <laughs> okay, they want to stone him for blasphemy because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Well, how did he make his, himself God? Well, John chapter 10, verse 36, a little further on, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. So because he said he was the Son of God, they take that to mean that he makes himself God saying that he has the same nature as the Father. And so, you know, I've went over these verses before in the deity of Christ, saying, you know, if you want proof of the deity of Christ, look at these verses where the Jesus, or where the Jews, um, <clears throat> you know, understood him saying that he is the Son of God, meaning that he is divine. And so we're looking at the same thing here, basically. We're just, we're looking more at, um, you know, his sonship, what does sonship signify? So Jesus is referred to as the Son of God and the Son of Man, distinguishing between his two natures. Okay, 
the Son of God uh, speaks of his divine nature, Son of Man speaks of his earthly nature. Okay? Uh, so, his human nature. Son designates the divine nature of Christ. Christ is called the Son of God because he is co-substantial with the Father and therefore equal to him in power and glory. The term expresses the relation of the second person or the second to the first person in the Trinity as it exists from eternity. It is therefore, as applied to Christ, not a term of office or nor expressive of any relation assumed in time. He was and is the eternal Son. That's who he is. It's essential to his person. Okay. So, again, I'll write those verses down. John 5, 17 and 18. John 10, 33. And John... 1036, which I like to do it like this, so 36, we'll just do like that. Okay, wonder. Now, this is where it gets more interesting to me, because I got a couple more, and these are pretty obvious. Okay, sonship, sonship signifies distinction in nature. For those of us who have been stay, saved and studying the Bible, you know, and we, we know the person of Jesus, you know, even um, you know, just a little bit, you can understand these things if you understand the Trinity. <clears throat> but let's go into the next one. Sonship signifies inheritance. So, let's see, am I running off the board? Inheritance. Oh, it looks like this one here. Okay. So, a son is the heir of the father. And we see in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So because Jesus is the son of God, he is the heir of all things. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Okay, and the son leads other sons of adoption to salvation as well as to the inheritance that is inherent to sonship both his and theirs. So in Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, Wherefore thou, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So because Jesus is the Son of God, and he is the heir, um, we also as adopted sons uh, become the heir through him. And so the Bible teaches a distinction between sons and servants. And I found this in the, um, the Eternal Sonship of Christ by George Zeller and Reynolds Showers. They mentioned this. And basically they had these three points. They had distinction, nature, inheritance. So I got this from there. And then I added the fourth one from the Eternal Submission because I'm not really quite sure what they're trying to express here about... Um, you know, they said the Bible teaches a distinction between sons and servants, basically. Uh, or that, you know, a son is heir and a servant is not. And I'm not sure if they were trying to uh, deny um, the fact that the son um, is in submission eternally to the father. But I think that this is a good point that they pointed out that sonship signifies inheritance. Um, but anyways, so to go into it a little more, I guess, Moses, uh, so the Bible teaches a distinction between sons and servants, Moses and Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, 
for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence by rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So we see Moses as a servant, but Christ as a son. And so servant, not here slave, but a ministering attendant, meaning that's what Moses was. He was a ministering attendant, free and spontaneous, marking Moses' high office toward God, though inferior to Christ. Christ was a servant also, but he was also the Son, Lord, and heir of all things. Not so Moses. Christ's service was assumed for the economy of salvation. Moses' was so naturally. Moses' service could not exceed human bounds. Christ's ministry was unique, capable of being fulfilled by God the Son alone. And so, uh, so yes, there's a sense in which Christ is a servant, or was. He, you know, he became a servant, I guess, when he took on, um, you know, the human nature. But <clears throat> there's also a sense in which Moses was the son, because he's an adopted son, just like all believers. Uh, but there's a contrast here that Jesus is higher because he is the unique son of God. Okay. And um, so he is the, you know, the direct heir uh, of the father. And uh, we see a comparison with Jesus and the angels in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, or a contrast anyway. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And then we see the angels are spoken of as ser servants in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7. And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. They are not all ministering, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So angels are not heirs. Okay, they are servants. And so in contrast to Jesus, Jesus is the unique, only first begotten Son of God, who is an heir, okay? So, sons are heirs, servants are not. Um, and there's parables that, uh, that, that talk about the Son uh, being an heir. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 through 39, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Householder of the vineyard, you know, sends uh, sends his servants. Let's see, he went into a far country, and uh, anyways, the people would kill his servants. But then he says, but you know, but he says, you know, I'll send my son, and you know, this is speaking of Jesus. Uh, through the parable, and uh, it talks about how the son is an heir. And in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32, we have um, the parable of the prodigal son, where we learn that the son is an heir also. So, the distinction here, though, is that sons are the heirs of their father's inheritance, and servants are not. The son is of a higher status in relation to the father than his servants. That does not mean, however, that sons are not to serve or submit to their father's authority. Indeed, they are. Okay, so... So we got here Hebrews 1, 2, and 4. Galatians 4 seven and then uh, the contrast between the servant the son and servants Hebrews five and six Hebrews five and 
Hebrews 1, 5, and 6. I think that's good enough for that. Let's go into it, and then I'll write down the parables. Matthew 21, uh, 33 through 39. Luke 15, 11 through 32. Okay. So the son has a right to the inheritance. Sons are heirs. <clears throat> so that's true for, you know, the son of God just says it is true for, you know, earthly sons. Now the last one. We have obedience. Let's see if I can get right, obedience. Yes, I do believe that sonship signifies obedience to the Father. Okay? Or that the Son is under the authority of the Father. Jesus, as the divine Son, whose sonship is not derived from another, is the prototype and the agent of granting others the right to be God's sons as well. The sonship of Christians is derived from his own sonship and patterned after it. And the pattern of that sonship is essentially obedience. And so we got John chapter 6, verse 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And John chapter 8, verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. So Jesus does the will of the Father, and he does the things that please him. And so I'm going to go ahead and write those down. John 6, 38, and 8, 29. Now, the Bible teaches that sons, even in their adult age, are to submit to the authority of their father. Because some might say, well, it's only true that a son is to submit to the authority of the father in their childhood. But, you know, once they're adult, they don't have to submit to, their, to the authority of their father. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that, you know, sons and daughters are to submit to the authority of their parents, even in their adulthood. Okay. <coughs> so, we got... Genesis chapter 42, verse 1 through 4. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Go you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother Jacob, sent not Joseph's brother Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. And so, I guess Jacob's in his old age here, his sons are adults, and he's telling them to go to go buy corn in Egypt, and so they do so. They're under the authority of their father. You know, he tells Benjamin not to go. And this is interesting and funny, too, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 17. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, so shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. So, <clears throat> after their father was dead, they thought that Joseph would hate them. And so what they did was they sent a messenger saying that, you know, uh, that the Father commanded that they forgive him. <laughs> and so, I mean, this falls under the idea that the Son's supposed to submit to the Father. And so, um, 
Joseph uh, being, you know, a godly son is to submit to his father's commands. And so they thought, you know, well, if we tell him this, then he's going to do this. So it's just, um, you know, it's just, it's for granted that, uh, you know, the godly son is supposed to submit to their father. Uh, and, and again, in that parable, Matthew twenty-one thirty-seven 37, uh, says, But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. The father sends the son, having authority over him. In the, in this, in the parable, the son, in, in Luke fifteen twenty-nine, the son is serving the father. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet you never gavest me a kid that I might make us marry with my friends. So he's saying, you know, uh, you know, I've done what was right. I've I've listened to your commandments. I've served you. And the Bible speaks of those who disobeyed their father's commands as ungodly. We see in First Samuel chapter two verse twelve that now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. So the sons of Eli were spoken of as sons of Belial. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 25, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, and because because the Lord would slay them, so because so because they hearken not to the voice of their father, the Lord would slay them, and so because they hearken not to the voice of their father, they were ungodly sons. That's why they didn't hearken unto His voice. Um, so the sons who uh, did not submit to their father's commands <clears throat> were spoke are spoken of as ungodly. So that's the biblical pattern that. Um, the father-son relation and the Trinity has designed for us that we are to submit to the Father. So that has to do with Christ's sonship. That's the significance of his sonship. Part of it is that he obeyed the Father. He's under the authority of the Father. So basically that's all I guess. And so it was kind of rough for me getting that out, but I'll try to add the link for uh, the study, and you can look over that and maybe gather things a little better. Could all use a little more refining, but uh, this is just kind of the first video of this series. I don't know how long it'll take me to get the others out. They're almost completed, but I just need to refine them a little more. There'll be a lot more scripture used in those, and... Um, uh, no, there's a lot more resource on the eternal sonship and the eternal submission and, you know, a little on the eternal generation. So those are three more that, are, that I'm going to be coming out with. This just has, this has to do with those. They all kind of go together in a way, but I think they all need to be kind of examined separately as well so we can understand them a little better uh, and see that it is biblical and you know the correct view of the sonship of Christ here the divine sonship is that his sonship is metaphysical it's essential to his person it's eternal it's real and the son can't be the son without the father the father can't be the father without the son um, <clears throat> and you know their design is is the, it's the archetype for us um, our sonship, our fatherhood is derived from the Trinity. And sonship signifies distinction, it signifies nature, it signifies inheritance, and it signifies obedience. So I hope you learned something today watching this video. And, you know, God bless you if you got through this. Uh, so uh, let me know what you think in the comments, and uh, there will be more. So. Thank you guys, and uh, I guess uh, go ahead and say a quick prayer. <sighs> Dear Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to do this. Thank you for those who are watching. Lord, I pray that you bless each and every one of them, wherever they're at in their lives, wherever they need you. Um, 
God, just be with us always. Uh, help us to keep you on our minds, Lord, and to follow you, to do what is right in your eyes, and to serve you to the fullest, Lord, and to spread the gospel. And I pray that the kingdom will spread, God. And we just thank you and praise you, God. You are wonderful, and you are supreme, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you guys for watching. God bless.